I'm going to talk this morning on ankle injuries and lateral ankle instability. You know, you don't uh, get too much uh, in the terms of lectures on uh, foot and ankle, but uh, it is an important topic in sports medicine, and uh, so we're going to try to cover a fairly large swath of it uh, today. Make sure this is going to work. <coughs> so uh, these will be the goals uh, for the presentation. Give you a little bit of historical background. In fact, we'll go way back. Uh, review the standard of care. Some information on the research we've done here. Uh, describe common presentations of lateral ankle injury and some of the associated conditions that occur uh, that can often mimic a lateral ankle sprain demonstrate some of the surgical techniques to deal with lateral ankle instability, and then uh, uh, look at some outcomes. So this is a quote that I have always liked. It's from Percival Pott, who lived in the 1700s and is uh, known for Pott's fracture of the ankle as well as a few other things. Um, he was subsequently knighted in, in England, not for saying this, but for other things. Um, he says, our ancestors deserve our best thanks for the assistance they've given us. Where we find them to be right, we are obliged to embrace their opinions as truths. But implicit faith is not required from man to man, and our reverence for our predecessors but must not prevent us from making our own judgments. And so I think that this is definitely the case in ankles. Um, in uh, the time period years ago when I was a resident, uh, there were some basic tenets that uh, were believed. Uh, at one point, it was thought that you could just fix the medial malleolus in an ankle fracture, a bimalleolar ankle fracture, and you didn't have to do anything with the fibula. That obviously was proven wrong. And then the same thing occurred uh, with bimalleolar fractures, saying you could just fix the fibula and you didn't have to fix the medial side, and that has subsequently been proven incorrect. So there. There are a lot of uh, things that were believed to be true earlier and I think are becoming uh, less the accepted. So we're going to go back a little bit in history. This is uh, the original textbook of history uh, recorded uh, from Herodotus of Halicarnassus um, who wrote in the time period of around four um, 430 to uh, 450 BC, or 450 to 430 as it would be, and uh, so over 2,500 years ago, and he talks about the first record of a severe ankle sprain, and uh, I attribute this reference to uh, Dr. Bonin, uh, who is from England, and recorded it in the um, textbook Injuries of the Ankle. And um, I found it fascinating. So <coughs> in the histories, he talks about a sprain that occurred to the king of Persia at the time. They had just defeated the Greeks at Erotus and had captured a large number of Greek uh, um, warriors at the time and, and others and had them imprisoned. And so King Darius was uh, celebrating and he was out hunting and when he uh, stepped off of his horse, he injured his ankle and injured it so severely that um, he, uh, he was unable to walk. He, uh, he subsequently uh, consulted his physicians. At the time, Egyptian physicians were considered to be the best in the world, um, in the Western world. And um, they actually treated him very aggressively with manipulation and made his injury worse. And so being unable to sleep for seven days, he was looking for any uh, method available to get better and was told that there was someone who knew something about medicine among the Greek uh, capt captives. And so he... he brought Democrates in chains from uh, where they had him imprisoned and, um, and brought him before King Darius uh, 
chained and in rags. And so uh, King Darius asked Democrates if he knew anything about medicine. And Democrates, thinking that if he said he did, he would somehow be punished, uh, indicated that uh, he really didn't know anything. So King Darius then decided that uh, since he didn't know anything, um, that he would bring out the uh, whips and the spiked uh, chains and uh, flog him. And um, immediately Democrates' memory improved. So, <clears throat> so it does go to show you if you know something about uh, ankles, you can avoid some punishment at times. So <clears throat> the next is uh, um, when he began treating uh, King Darius, he used the typical treatments uh, of the Greeks, which were more advanced at the time. This was the time um, when um, Hippocrates was um, practicing in the Greek school of medicine was really much more active at the time. And so through uh, this, so this, this is actually a quote from, um, her, from the histories. Uh, Darius put himself under his care and Democrates by using the remedies customary among the Greeks and changing the violent treatment of the Egyptians for the milder remedies customary among the Greeks first enabled him to get some sleep and then in a very little time restored him altogether after he had quite lost the hope of ever having the use of his foot. So he was very grateful and then, uh, and then put uh, Democrates back in captivity in gold chains instead of the other ones. Um, and so Democrates uh, uh, decided to uh, uh, request if something better might be done and uh, Subsequently, uh, Democrates was asked to sit at the table of the king for meals and eventually was given his freedom and allowed to return to Greece. So uh, you can see that sometimes great reward comes to those who know something about the ankle. So uh, next we, um, we look at Hippocrates in his... Uh, uh, writings on the articulations around 400 BC mentions injury to the ankle uh, when the dislocation is the ankle joint. If outward, they become varus, but they can still stand. <coughs> and then Galen, um, in his uh, work on the usefulness of the parts of the body in about 350 BC, uh, he was one of the personal physicians, the gladiators, um, later to Roman emperors, uh, and he wrote. Um, this, this work uh, on anatomy that was basically accepted for fact, uh, completely uncontested until the 1500s. So um, unfortunately it was anatomical reports based mostly on dissections of monkeys and pigs. Um, until about 1500 you could be either put in uh, prison forever or uh, uh, or put to death for um, uh, digging up remains of humans and doing dissections on them. So it wasn't until the time of Andreas Vesalius um, from Italy uh, who wrote De Humani Corpus Fabrica in 1543. He printed descriptions and illustrations of human dissections and this led to the modern era of human anatomy. So. I think that there's, there's a lot that goes into the history of what we do in orthopedics and, uh, and certainly in, uh, in ankle surgery, and I would say we probably uh, fell behind some of the other areas initially. Uh, there was more work done in the hand on uh, tendon and ligament injuries, and, and certainly with all the uh, um, attention <coughs> placed on the anterior cruciate ligament, um, uh, that certainly led the way in many respects regarding ligament injury. <clears throat> so I've sort of divided the history of what we do in the ankle uh, to a pre-antibiotic um, era. So before about 1940, with the introduction of uh, antibiotics, it was really safer to brace people who had uh, severe ankle instabilities. And so that was 
generally what was done. And then uh, in the pre-anatomic era, uh, we did things like this on the knee. This is uh, a picture of a Macintosh uh, procedure and exposure uh, that was done taking a large amount of IT band as you see. And, um, and so in the ankle also, tenodeses were really the most common form of treatment um, taking a portion or all of a perineal tendon and using that as the reconstruction or uh, even earlier a portion of the IT band was used by Elmsley. And it wasn't until about 1985 in the ankle that uh, the anatomic reconstruction or secondary repairs really became more popular. Uh, they were actually written about in about 1966 uh, by Leonard Brostrom, uh, who was um, from Scandinavia, and uh, he wrote a number of articles on the ankle that were really some of the foundational work on treating ankles, whether acute or chronic. And um, in that, he talked about doing a secondary repair of lateral ankle ligaments for instability by finding the existing ligaments that had been stretched out and simply tightening them and uh, that that could work. So anatomic reconstructions became more popular. Uh, Bill Hamilton in the United States was one of the primary advocates. Um, he was the um, doctor for the New York Ballets and uh, uh, was one of the past presidents of the Foot and Ankle Society, so his um, position gave him a, a platform for that. And then uh, Nathaniel Gould, who was the chairman uh, at the University of Vermont, also wrote about doing Brostrom procedures and, um, and how to augment them with tightening of the inferior extensor retinaculum, which became known as the Brostrom-Gould procedure, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then since about 2005, I would say, there's been a real push uh, for aggressive rehabilitation of ankles, um, both from, uh, and probably even before that, for acutes, and uh, even more so now for chronic uh, ankle instability following surgery. And so there's, uh, there's been uh, a need for uh, more strength in the repairs and reconstructions. So this is a picture of the procedure that was really the most common procedure when, when I was a resident. It was called a Chrisman snip procedure. It took half of the perineus brevis and then weaved it through the talus and through the fibula and through the uh, uh, calcaneus and uh, really was not anatomic, but was very successful at restricting movement and that could make the ankle more stable. Unfortunately, it could also lead to long-term problems uh, very similar to the other procedures that were used like the Evans procedure, the Watson-Jones procedure, um, and uh, Larson <coughs> procedure. All were tenodesis procedures uh, that were used to stabilize the ankle and, and yet over a long-term period uh, typically caused arthritic changes in the joint. So, so if we go back, uh, Elmsley actually had it uh, close to correct. If you look at his reconstruction using the iliotibial band for recurrent subluxation of the ankle joint, um, he only reported four cases uh, and that may have been one of the reasons it didn't gain a lot of popularity, but uh, it really is fairly anatomical in its orientation, uh, but really uh, fell out of favor, really was not um, that popular in the United States. So let's look at a little bit of the epidemiology. So it's the most common time loss injury in sports, uh, occurs one per 10,000 person days, that's about two million per year in the United States alone with an annual health care cost of about two billion dollars. Um, persistent symptoms occur in 15 <coughs> to 20 percent of patients who have um, ankle sprains and they constitute about 30 percent of all athletic injuries. So if you look at the incidence, it's about um, 
0.83 per thousand athletes. And so in comparison, ACLs are about 0.15 per thousand and concussions are about 0.28 per thousand. So it um, behooves you in sports medicine to know something about ankle sprains because you're going to see a lot of them. Uh, there are risk factors. The peak incidence is ages 10 to 19, not surprising. Um, and males predominate, particularly in the ages of 15 to 24. And then females have uh, uh, more prevalence of ankle sprains in the ages 30 to 99, probably because they live longer than we do. Um, and then athletic involvement accounts for about 45 to 50 percent of the ankle sprains. Um, and race, uh, it's higher in blacks and whites than Hispanics. That may relate to other factors. So some of the contributing factors, obesity, uh, skeletal foot morphology like a cavus foot or a cavo varus foot, uh, high risk activities, sports uh, in particular, and then connective tissue laxity, um, uh, which may just be congenital laxity uh, versus uh, having a collagen dis disease such as Ehlers-Danlow or something like that. And I think uh, you all know that orthopedics is applied anatomy. And so we're going to uh, begin with a little bit of that and uh, look at how we've done the research uh, here. Um, and you see that it's based on anatomy and biomechanics um, and then progresses uh, from uh, anatomic uh, repairs and reconstructions to evaluating clinical out outcomes. So as you know, that's uh, Dr. LaProd's uh, baby and uh, that's the way we've uh, done it here at the ankle also. So one of our first studies was published in JBGS on the, uh, an anatomic investigation of the lateral ankle ligaments for surgical reconstruction procedures. It's based on work done previously by a Tarian out of Duke, uh, published in AGSM in 1985, and then um, work in clinical anatomy uh, from 2008 by London Beckram and Van Dyke. And so uh, we know that the anterior talofibular ligament, or the ATFL, is the primary restraint to inversion and internal rotation. Um, you can see the dimensions, load to failure uh, on testing was about 140 to 160 newtons. Um, it has greater strain than the CFL does, and it's um, composed of one to three bands in a Tarian, uh, and then Decrum found that two was the most common in our own study uh, we found that it was, uh, in 14 specimens, it was seven each way. <coughs> so you see the double, um, see if I can make that come up, and I can't, here we go. So one, two bands, the ATFL there, and one band there. So um, in our study, uh, we looked at specific locations for the origin and insertion of each uh, ligament on the fibula, the talus, and the fibula and the calcaneus. So this is the anterior talofibular ligament uh, measuring from the inferior tip of the lateral malleolus uh, toward the, uh, the lateral ankle joint. It measured 13.8 uh, millimeters on average and approximately 50% of the longitudinal difference or distance between those points. And then the insertion site for the single band, uh, which is what is used uh, mostly for reconstructions, um, is 17.8 millimeters uh, from the apex of the lateral Taylor process uh, to the uh, anterior uh, point of the articular cartilage of the trochlea located here and 17.8 <coughs> millimeters on average for the specimens and uh, approximately 62 percent of the distance in that location. So that can be used for making drill holes for reconstructions. 
the calcaneofibular ligament, on the other hand, is the primary restraint to inversion, particularly in neutral and dorsiflexion. Uh, you see the measurements for it. It's mostly a tubular uh, structure as opposed to the ATFL, which is flatter. Um, load to failure is stronger, approximately 350 newtons. Angles 10 to 45 degrees posterior to the uh, line of the fibula and makes an angle of about 105 degrees with the ATFL, but there's a lot of variation to these angles and that seems to be related to a degree as to why some people are more susceptible um, to ankle sprains. So you see the angle there uh, between the two ligaments. Um, we also uh, noted origin and insertion sites for the CFL. It's uh, about five millimeters anterior to the inferior tip of the lateral malleolus. And then the Taylor, um, uh, actually the calcaneal attachment, 16.3 millimeters posterior superior to the posterior point of the perineal tubercle uh, that you see here. This is perineal tubercle where the perineus brevis goes above, perineus longus goes below, posterior point measured Posterior goes about 14 and then up four. Our straight longitudinal distance is about 16.3. So that gives you some measurements that you can use when you're doing reconstructions to try to be a little more anatomically accurate. So how do these um, ankle problems present? Well, obviously you can present with an acute ankle sprain uh, versus a chronic one. And then probably what I see most commonly is um, not necessarily the acute ankle sprain. Now, those are going to come in to see the family practice doctor or uh, go into the emergency room. And you usually don't see those as an orthopedic surgeon. You see a lot of them when you're an athletic trainer um, in the acute situation. But you don't see those so often in a, an orthopedic practice unless you're working specifically with a sports program and you're there um, in the training room on a regular basis. So you're mostly seeing the chronics or what I see is an acute sprain in someone who has a history of chronic instability. And I think that that's, um, that's the more common uh, problem that I see. Uh, you also see people who'll come in with a recurrent instability and then you'll see people who come in with ankle pain and then have instability when you <coughs> examine them. So let's take a look at acute lateral ankle sprains. What does uh, evidence-based me medicine support? Well, for mild to moderate sprains, um, and this comes from Cochrane database, um, non-operative treatment with rest, ice, compression, elevation, uh, plus uh, any of these as well. Supervised early exercise, um, anti-inflammatory medications, and functional treatment with early weight bearing using either a lace-up brace, a semi-rigid stirrup brace, a walking boot, or uh, crutches, uh, and crutches only as needed. Uh, some of the newer information suggests that in severe ankle sprains, 10 days of casting is advisable. And so that makes it important to realize what is a severe ankle sprain. So the issues in severe ankle sprain related to surgery versus no surgery were sort of highlighted by um, Pilla Jamaki in this uh, level one study reported in JBGS in 2010. And so cost is obviously higher with surgery. Um, complications go up with surgery. Re-injuries are increased with functional treatment. Late arthritis was increased with surgery, although to a very small degree, and return to pre-injury status was similar, and the functional outcome was slightly better with surgery. The problem with this study was it had a very small sample size, no power analysis, a large number were lost to follow up. There was dissimilar aftercare between the groups, outdated post-operative treatment, and not high-level athletes. So. 
I think that while it gives us some information, it really doesn't uh, compare well to what we, uh, we see in an athletic population particularly and um, doesn't give us all the information we need to know about how to treat these. So who would you treat surgically with an acute ankle sprain? I think it's pretty obvious if it was an open injury, you would treat that surgically. Um, if they have other associated pathology, dislocating perineal tendons, osteochondral fractures, or loose bodies in the joint that you see on x-ray, um, if it's a bimalleolar fracture variant, in other words, if they have injury to the medial side and are unstable there, and an injury to the lateral side and they're unstable there, it's essentially a bimalleolar variant, they need to be stabilized. Large avulsion fractures, there's been a recommendation that those uh, be treated surgically. And then high-level athletes is still an area of significant controversy. And um, I think in the right circumstance with a severe sprain, um, it is advantageous to treat those surgically. And I'm, um, so I'm speaking uh, in part for Dr. Fagan, uh, who uh, emailed me uh, this weekend, and, and he said he wanted to be here to be sure I was historically accurate, um, but he couldn't make it. Um, but I know that at his, in his time at West Point, and, and Bill can certainly uh, corroborate this, um, he believed that surgical treatment of, of severe ankle sprains gave better results than treating them non-operatively. Is that right, Bill? Correct. Yeah, and, and I, I think that that's definitely what I've seen as well. You can get the patient back faster with a better result in, in an athlete who has a very severe sprain. In other words, they have uh, on examination a positive anterior drawer. You can almost dislocate them. Uh, they give you a history of the lateral ankle hitting the ground and um, they may not be in a whole lot of pain because they've torn all their nerves there. Uh, and they may not have uh, a huge amount of swelling necessarily, but they will definitely be uh, unstable and, um, and they may have a number of other things injured. Um, in um, one of the NBA players who, who I was taking care of when I was with the Rockets, he was uh, one of the point guards and in the uh, in the um, postseason, actually the last game that the Rockets played in the postseason that year, he uh, landed on another player uh, doing a layup toward the end of the game, um, uh, stepped on the pay, uh, player's foot, ankle rolled, and I was sitting on the bench looking right at it, and I could see that he basically dislocated his ankle. And so he came in, uh, he was extremely unstable, and we operated on him um, the next week uh, back in Houston. And um, he had <coughs> torn his anterior capsule all the way from the medial side all the way across. He tore his ATFL, his CFL, he had a partial tear of his PTFL, his posterior talofibular ligament, and he tore his superior perineal retinaculum and dislocated his perineal tendons. So that was obviously a little more severe ankle sprain than you uh, necessarily see all the time. But if somebody like that came in from a recreational uh, injury and you didn't recognize the severity of the injury uh, at first, um, you would be dealing with a chronic problem for a, a good while perhaps. So just uh, a little anecdotal, sorry. So this is a picture of an ankle that I took um, after I had uh, wandered into the emergency room um, just by chance. And there was a patient in the emergency room that they said had injured the ankle and just wanted me to take a look. And, uh, and so I, I took a look. They were about to send this patient out after uh, cleaning up the ankle and uh, Noting the location, um, I thought we should uh, examine the patient a little more carefully. The patient had a dislocatable ankle, and this is an open injury. So that was the stress test. 
on the patient. So you have to be aware that even small openings around the ankle can be an indication of an open um, dislocation there. And then this is an example of an osteochondral injury that can occur with severe ankle injuries. And you can see the osteochondral fragment there where the lateral uh, shoulder of the talus has been sheared off, which is a common injury with um, ankle sprains that are severe. So one of the things that I look at in these patients that present uh, acutely um, but have a chronic history, uh, are they mechanically unstable? Um, is there a history of a bad ankle sprain where they had to be on crutches, they had to have it immobilized, they couldn't walk on it for a while? Um, uh, was it properly rehabilitated? One of the things that's been shown in European soccer is severe ankle sprains uh, often occur uh, most commonly in those athletes who didn't fully rehabilitate following a, um, a lesser sprain of the ankle. And so it's really important that the uh, patients with ankle sprain be properly rehabilitated before returning to their sport. And then are there signs of secondary problems, perineal tendon pathology, osteochondral lesions, um, or early arthritis? And then finally, the question is, is it the right time to fix their instability? So um, we typically confirm their mechanical instability, both clinically and radiographically. Uh, it helps them to see what is going on. And sometimes you'll do uh, a stress x-ray on an ankle and see instability like this. And sometimes uh, you can get fooled and see instability at the subtalar joint and not at the ankle joint. Correct, Dr. Backus? Yes, so we had one just recently with that. Um, and then you need to rule out other causes, so uh, that's very important. Um, and one of the things to remember is instability usually is not the source of pain. It can be because it can cause a lot of synovitis in the joint. But if there's pain, it's really important to look for other things. And um, I think Dr. Ho could attest to that because we get a fair number of MRIs on ankles that have both instability and pain. And normally he can find something wrong with them other than just their scarred or missing lateral ligaments. Right, Charlie? Always something. Always something. Yes. So, so that's the main reason for using uh, MRI is to be sure that you don't miss something else going on in the ankle. So why do we fix chronic lateral instability? Now, one reason is because they get recurrent sprains. That's fairly obvious. Uh, they can injure the cartilage. Uh, it changes their joint kinematics. They have increased stress on their perineal tendons that are the dynamic stabilizers laterally, as opposed to the ligaments that are the static stabilizers. The perineal tendons in these patients often have tenosynovitis and occasionally uh, tears. And then later development of arthritis. The patient you see depicted in the x-rays below had no history of any injury to the ankle other than ankle sprains, and yet had gone on to develop severe arthritis and ended up with a total ankle replacement. And so uh, if you look at ankle replacements and ankle fusions, uh, the most common cause for requiring uh, those uh, procedures is trauma. It's, it's not osteoarthritis, it's not rheumatoid arthritis like it is in the hip or in the knee, but it's traumatic injury. So I would suggest that even though we think we take care of ankle injuries well, uh, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, this is a study uh, done by Bischoff uh, out of Duke and um, looked at seven patients with unilateral lateral ankle instability, used 3D MRI and biplanar fluoroscopy, and found increase in peak strain and a shift in the location um, of peak strain, anterior and medial, 
uh, which corresponds to the area where clinical osteoarthritis typically occurs. So they suggested that uh, lateral ankle instability by altering areas of peak contact forces um, led to some of these arthritic changes we see. Okay, what are some of the other causes of instability? Because they aren't all lateral ankle. Um, you can see it in patients who have hyperflexibility syndrome, so it's important to recognize that. Tarsal coalitions, which limit the motion at the subtalar joint, put more stress on the ankle, and in these individuals, you'll often get a history of uh, chronic sprains, and uh, that should be something that you look at carefully. Do, does the patient have subtalar um, movement or not? Uh, neuromuscular disease can do it, um, like Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Um, they often have weak perineals and will have a history of lateral ankle sprains. Perineal tendon pathology alone can produce instability, and then Finally, you can have functional instability. So what is functional instability? Um, this was uh, the definition that Hurdle used um, in this uh, article in Sports Medicine. I really like it. It's the occurrence of recurrent joint instability and the sensation of joint instability that's due to the contributions of any neuromuscular deficits. And that can include injury to the joint mechanoreceptors and afferent nerves, leading to all of these different things. And so it's important to recognize whether you're dealing with functional instability or mechanical instability. And so that's one of the reasons that rehabilitation is so important in the treatment of ankle sprains, acute ankle sprains. So what about mechanical instability? Now, Hurdle defined that as laxity of a joint due to structural damage to the ligamentous tissues which support the joint, and that needs something done mechanically to treat it. Um, do we get routine x-rays? Well, the Ottawa ankle rules, um, which were designed in Canada for use in the emergency room, would suggest that maybe you don't need to, um, and I would... Um, emphasize that you always need to get x-rays in these patients who present to your office because uh, oftentimes they will have something uh, that is um, visible on an x-ray and yet they may not fall into the category where the Ottawa ankle rules apply. So they may work in the emergency room, but they don't work in the orthopedic office. Stress x-rays are controversial. Um, there's a variability in normal, uh, whether to use anesthesia or not, manual or instrumented, and whether to use side-to-side -side comparison or just look at the affected side. Um, there is no clear need acutely, although we often uh, will use it just to show someone how unstable they are. A uh, picture is often worth a thousand words. And um, in chronic instability, it's valuable to document what the patient's feeling and have uh, before and after images from surgery. Um, MRI uh, mentioned is controversial um, and uh, more useful in chronics than in acutes, uh, and yet we often see a lot of other pathology as, as I mentioned, uh, but it's a little bit related to our population of patients here. Uh, it's important to remember that you you can see a lot of intraarticular pathology with ankle sprains, particularly to the articular cartilage. Uh, uh, Rick Verkel um, in California has done a lot of work on ankle arthroscopy, found a 93% incidence of intraarticular pathology in patients who had ankle instability. Uh, Taga from Japan found a 95% incidence of chondral injuries in patients with chronic uh, lateral instability. Uh, and there are a number of other studies. So um, it, it is something that you can use, and you often find articular cartilage injuries on these patients with chronic instability. So there is, valuable, um, there is value in arthroscoping the patients um, for those of you who are in the sports medicine world. 
Um, and what about the fracture that looks like an ankle sprain? The one that's most common is a lateral Taylor process fracture, also called a snowboarder's fracture. So this is the fracture. Uh, looking at it in a coronal plane image, you see the fracture line goes into the subtalar joint here at the lateral process. So it's, it's a common injury um, that is often missed, and it's missed because the pain and the swelling are located right where the lateral ankle ligaments are located. And so, so this is an example. This is a 24-year-old male professional snowboarder who came to see us after uh, injuring his ankle. He said that his boot collapsed. He was able to weight bear. He was uh, tender over the anterior lateral ankle, uh, not over the fibula. He didn't meet um, any of the criteria of the Ottawa ankle rules to be x-rayed, but they x-rayed him anyway. Um, and so you can see that they found that there was no acute fracture. This is the report out of uh, the radiology department at uh, a sister hospital that's about 45 minutes toward Denver. And um, so... There's the injury, and there it is on MRI. You see it's a pretty large fragment of bone uh, that's been fractured there. So uh, this injury occurs primarily with a, a dorsiflexion with either inversion or eversion. It's intraarticular and it's frequently missed and can cause long-term problems. So. Uh, just be aware of it, particularly if it's a snowboarder. Anterior process fractures are another mimic. Um, the actual site of pain and swelling is usually a little bit more anterior than what you would see with a lateral ankle. But if you're seeing them late, uh, that may be obscured by the uh, degree of swelling and pain that they have. Um, and there are a number of different mechanisms, either uh, inversion or eversion that can produce this. Uh, and then posterior process fractures uh, can also um, be a mimic of lateral ankle sprains, although the pain's usually more posterior. Um, so this is an example of an anterior process fracture uh, that was missed and patient came in with this uh, degree of edema on the T2 images that you see on the top left. Um, remember, there are a lot of structures that are very close together in the ankle. Uh, so you have ankle ligaments, and then you have the subtalar uh, ligaments uh, that you see here um, with the interosseous talocalcaneal and the, and the uh, cervical ligament. So lots of things close together, perineal tendons, um, nerves, lots of things there. So. You can even see this. This is one patient who came in with all of these injuries simultaneous. He had torn his syndesmosis, dislocated his perineal tendons, tore his lateral ligaments, the ankle could sublux, um, ruptured his Achilles tendon, and had a fibular fracture. And so um, the lesson from that is be careful when you're heli skiing because uh, that's how he did that. Ankle sprains can be part uh, of the clinical picture, but they may instead be, um, it may mimic um, uh, the injury or mask concomitant injuries. And so it's really important to be especially vigilant in circumstances where patient is not getting better or where uh, the patient has a reason to have a more significant injury. So. Uh, a snowboarder landing flat who has a lot of pain, you've got to look for something more than just an ankle sprain. Somebody who's elderly with um, osteoporosis, you need to look for something more as well. Um, so if the history doesn't fit, then, uh, or that it's a special at-risk population, uh, be cautious to look for some of these other things. All of these um, can mimic a lateral ankle sprain and be a wolf in sheep's clothing for you. 
another thing to consider is associated pathology. And that's because uh, this can be a real problem in dealing with patients who have ankle sprains if they have um, a cavovarus foot, um, then they are predisposed to rolling the ankle. And there may be an underlying neurological reason why they, they have this, such as Charcot-Marie tooth disease. So it's important to recognize that there are um, uh, positions of the foot that do increase the risk. So they aren't a too many toes sign, which goes along with flat foot, um, but they have what's called a peekaboo heel sign. So if you look at the heel, you can see it when you're looking at the patient who's standing facing you and the heel uh, appears on the inside of the foot. And normally that is not the case because the normal heel is in about seven degrees of heel valgus. So if you see this in a patient who has chronic lateral ankle instability, <clears throat> it may or may not suggest that you have to do something to treat this at the same time that you do something with the lateral ankle ligaments. So you can also look at the foot and see if there's increased pressure um, on the lateral border of the foot. Uh, as you see here, there's a large callus in this patient over the uh, fifth metatarsal head, and you can see in aligning the foot that there's some forefoot varus. And so <clears throat> you want to do a Coleman block test. It's not just useful in pediatrics, it can be useful in adults as well because it determines hind foot flexibility. If you have hind foot flexibility, then uh, you may have a uh, forefoot driven varus and therefore you can treat that with an orthotic device. So you want to see if they go from heel varus to a more aligned position when you put the heel on the block and the uh, first ray is off the medial side of the block as opposed to not moving at all which would suggest that it's a rigid deformity which might require uh, doing something like a Dwyer osteotomy and moving the heel into a more valgus position surgically to protect your lateral uh, repair reconstruction. Um, so this is um, what you can do um, non-operatively. So let's talk now about the surgical technique. So uh, I mentioned the non-anatomical uh, methods of treating it versus anatomical. Um, and the christman <coughs> snook method uh, is sort of out of favor now, and we're trying to use more anatomical reconstructions like you see in almost other, every other joint area. So uh, we'll begin with the Brostrom Ghoul procedure. Uh, we typically start with a stress x-ray under anesthesia to document the degree of instability, arthroscope the ankle. In a condition where it's just lateral ankle instability and I'm doing just a brostrum ghoul procedure, you can use a curvilinear incision that follows the anterior border of the fibula. And this works quite well. It's very limited. Um, and you can get to everything that you need to there. Um, if you have other pathology, a, a more longitudinal incision uh, along the posterior border of the fibula and then angling over the, uh, over the sinus tarsi area is more useful. So you can make an incision over the posterior aspect of the fibula and then angle over the sinus tarsi. You can raise the flap and you can see across the anterior joint you can see the perineals and you can work in the sinus tarsi area if you need to th through that approach. So once you expose the uh, perineus tertius fascia, you can dissect underneath to find the lateral joint line of the ankle. Um, you want to put a right angle retractor there and then you can place um, a curved instrument under the anterior lateral joint capsule and exit just in front of the uh, perineal tendons. So this just shows the anatomy there. And so that's where you're looking, that's where you're exiting, um, such as that. And then you can divide that either close to the fibula, so you can use suture anchors 
to reattach the native ligaments, or you can simply divide it in mid-substance and imbricate it with sutures. Both methods work, and, um, and we'll, we'll see a little bit of the uh, minor differences that you see in testing it. So once you've done that and divided it, then you can uh, look for other pathology, as in this patient who had lesion on the lateral uh, aspect of the uh, shoulder of the talus. You can repair it with sutures, and, and then you can reinforce it, taking the inferior extensor retinaculum and suturing it to the periosteum of the anterior um, fibula. You have to be careful, though, in chronic situations, sometimes the periosteum has been sheared off the distal fibula, and you may even have a calcaneofibular ligament that's still attached to periosteum, but has it, it has no attachment to bone. And so on direct vision, it looks like the CFL is intact, and even on MRI, it may look like it's intact, and yet there's instability there because there's no attachment to bone. So it's important to recognize that when you see it and, um, and reattach it to bone, uh, usually with suture anchors. And then we immobilize the patient uh, for about seven to 10 days in a splint, and you see the Brostrom uh, procedure there. So one of the things we did, we looked biomechanically, uh, we thought that using suture anchors uh, for reattachment of the ATFL would be stronger than just using sutures alone. Uh, we did this uh, study um, published in 2012. Norm Waldrop was the fellow at the time. And what we found was the ultimate failure load uh, for the Brostrom procedure uh, with sutures was 68 newtons. When the suture anchor was in the fibula, it was 79 newtons. In the talus, 75 newtons no statistical difference in those. And the intact ATFL is, uh, in our specimens was about 161 newtons. And then stiffness, the brostrum was six newtons per millimeter. The suture anchor in the fibula, 6.8. Suture anchor in the talus, 6.6. .6. And the normal intact ATFL had a stiffness of 12.4. And so you can see that you have significant differences in a Brostrom procedure done with suture or with suture anchors. And um, all three of the repair groups were much weaker than the intact uninjured ATFL. And so clinically, that means that you need to protect the Brostrom, whether it's done with sutures or with anchors. So there'd been a, a lot of movement in the orthopedic uh, sports medicine world to really push the Brostrom and not immobilize them. And uh, there have been several studies that showed that that's not such a good thing. The clinical outcomes uh, in certain patient groups were reported to be less successful by several studies. Uh, larger athletes, long-standing chronic instability where the tissue isn't quite as good and varus heals. And so this is a study done by Nick Mafuli, who was in uh, London at the time. Uh, and one of the things that he found is with the Brostrums, only 58% returned to their pre-injury level of activity, 16% returned to a lower level of activity, and 26% abandoned athletic activity um, uh, on longer-term follow-up of the Brostrum procedures. So um, that suggested that more needed to be done. And then this study uh, done by Kirk um, out of Lou Schoen's lab, in Baltimore found that ATFL elongation occurred after Brostrom procedures if they were not uh, protected. So it's a, another biomechanical study and showed loss of uh, stability uh, if there was early unprotected mobilization. Um, so <clears throat> there are different ways to augment it. You can use the Gould modification with the inferior extensor retinaculum. You can use an Evans procedure with a perineus uh, uh, longus or brevis tendon. Uh, that has been popularized by the Ortho Carolina group. 
um, in this article published by Gerard uh, in 1999. Although if you look at the work done in Europe by Rosenbaum, they've shown that over the long term, over uh, 15 to 20 year period, Evans procedures typically produce arthritis in the ankle joint because they restrict motion. So uh, Gordon Mackay uh, visited here and suggested that a method called an internal brace using suture tape with swivel locks might be useful. It had been used in the shoulder and, uh, and so we <coughs> looked at it to see if it had any uh, usefulness in the ankle. Uh, we did a biomechanical study comparing the augmented brostrum with this method uh, to the intact ATFL and what we found is it significantly improved the strength. It also increased stiffness so there's some concern there um, and it's very important how it's tensioned and so we'll look at that. So these are the steps in doing an augmented brostrum. You identify and prepare the ATFL and CFL um, and if you're using anchors, realize that you have a limited amount of geographic space on your fibula. Uh, you place the 475 swivel lock into a pre-drilled, pre-tapped Taylor tunnel at the anatomical insertion of the ATFL, repair the ATFL and the CFL, and then place sutures from the 475 swivel lock into a 35 swivel lock, gauge the length for your insertion into the pre-drilled and tapped tunnel in the fibula, it's just superficial to the ATFL and then insert the swivel lock in the fibula and tighten it over a hemostat, a standard hemostat uh, with just light pressure um, on the uh, suture tape to avoid over tensioning it. It's really acting as an in internal brace. Uh, so you don't want to stress shield your repair. Um, so this is the way it's done. Um, you make the drill hole for your suture anchors, for example, in the fibula. Then you make the drill hole in the talus for the swivel lock. Place the swivel lock into the talus. Uh, repair the ATFL and CFL, and then make your hole in the fibula and place the other swivel lock um, into the fibula. And then you can mark length and then place uh, the swivel lock and tighten it over a hemostat and then cut it. So it um, works very well and is very effective in not only protecting your ATFL repair, but it also allows you to be more aggressive in the rehabilitation since you have uh, something in that's going to block the ankle from uh, excessive motion. So if we continue working on building the pyramid here, um, what if the ligaments are irreparably damaged or chronically damaged and insufficient and likely to fail? Well, that's where you may consider using internal brace, but uh, we've typically used an allograft reconstruction. So this is the study that we did on allograft reconstructions using a semitendinosus allograft. Um, and we found that the allograft and the native ATFL have similar strength and stiffness. Uh, this was the uh, measurements that we found in this study and they were um, not significantly different. Um, so anatomic reconstruction was found to demonstrate similar strength and stiffness at time zero in a fresh frozen cadaveric model and so we felt that we could duplicate the anatomy and biomechanics of the lateral ligaments. Um, I use it particularly for failed prior reconstructions. As you see here, this patient's already had a brostrum with two metal anchors in the fibula. And so generally in this circumstance, you don't have tissue available to use for the uh, secondary repair. So you have to bring in good tissue to reconstruct the ligaments. Um, <clears throat> it's also useful in large athletes or those with hypermobility. If you use their own tissue, they typically are still hypermobile, so uh, using a tendon graft can be useful in that circumstance. 
So this is the surgical technique uh, for ligament reconstruction. It's pretty much the same regardless of what you're uh, doing, whether it's at the knee or elsewhere. You can use an autograft of a semi-T, um, and in some countries that is the only thing you can do. So you have to be comfortable taking a semi-T autograph if you need to, and then um, uh, you want to be sure you position it correctly. That's why we did the study showing the, the distances, because you want it to be anatomical. Um, you want the fixation to be strong. You want to tension it uh, correctly, avoid stress riders, risers, and then use an intensive rehabilitation program. So not too different from what you would do with, uh, with a knee or a shoulder. So different graft strengths. You can see a semi-T is plenty strong in comparison to the native lateral ankle ligaments. Uh, anatomical placement avoids capturing the joint and restricting subtalar or tibiotalar motion, or the only other thing that'll happen is it'll stretch out over time. So this is the technique uh, for that, uh, for the lateral ankle ligament reconstruction procedure. You need a bone tunnel in the talus uh, located at the anatomic side of the anterior talofibular ligament. Remember that's about 62% of the distance from the lateral tip to the anterior corner. Uh, you make a drill hole in the fibula. I would suggest you make it a little more angled up to about here. It's usually about a 45 degree angle uh, of insertion of the ATFL to the longitudinal line of the fibula and gives you more room for your second tunnel, which is for the calcaneofibular ligament. This should be about five um, millimeters there to the tip and you should have about a centimeter at least between your two drill holes. <clears throat> then um, you can place your tendon graft in the uh, Taylor tunnel. We usually will drill the calcaneal tunnel um, before uh, we finish. We place the swivel lock uh, or place the uh, interference fit screw into the tunnel uh, against the tendon using the biotinodesis inserter and then you'll take the uh, tendon through the anterior talofibular ligament arm here. Let's move that along. So there's the fibular tunnel. Then we'll typically put the interference fit screw in with the ankle in slight plantar flexion and neutral inversion eversion and make sure you have a bump under the leg, not under the heel and do a posterior drawer and tighten your um, biotinodesis screw against the tendon. That sets the tension on the ATFL and then you place the um, the tendon graft through the calcaneofibular ligament um, hole in the fibula. You've got a hole drilled for the calcaneal tunnel and then insert the tendon into the calcaneal tunnel. I usually use the beef pin pulled all the way through, not like you're seeing it here because I want good tension on it and I can get that better by pulling on the sutures across the medial side and then place the uh, interference fit screw against the uh, tendon within the tunnel there. So they, um, they're in a splint for seven to ten days. They weight bear is tolerated in a walking boot uh, after taking the splint and sutures out. Physical therapy starts between one and four weeks depending upon how many visits they have available. 
and uh, they use a brace or tape protection when they return to sports following their functional rehab and testing. You see in the boot, do the strengthening exercises, work on proprioception, and then <clears throat> before they return to sports, we'll um, sometimes do sports testing. This is Anna doing the sports test on Yao Ming before he went back to play. And uh, you see it looks sort of like a dwarf working with uh, someone. Sorry, Anna. And then uh, and so this is a Y balance test and uh, has been validated um, uh, in terms of uh, its uh, testing ability for um, proprioception. And then we'll typically put them back to doing what they actually do um, in a setting that's controlled so that you can determine if they can actually do the things they're supposed to do. This was a wide receiver. We wanted to be sure that he could sprint and cut, and um, he was able to do that before we put him back into a practice situation. <clears throat> so this is a case, 39-year-old female. It had a previous um, uh, procedure that had failed. Uh, you can see the degree of instability on testing and then on arthroscopy uh, you can see here that there's a fair amount of synovitis within the joint but the articular cartilage really looks uh, pretty good uh, and there's not much there along the lateral gutter uh, when we're looking and so then this is the procedure and then this is after procedure and the testing that's done to confirm stability. So <clears throat> the top of the pyramid is outcomes. So we really want to know does what we do really work? And so uh, these are our outcomes. This is comparing 55 Brostrom Gould procedures done before I use the internal brace with 21 uh, reconstructions using an allograft. All of these patients had at least two year follow up and um, average was three years. And you can see that um, results were very similar um, and uh, there were really no major significant differences between the two groups. So it led us to believe that the allograft reconstruction uh, when it's necessary, could give you a successful result um, in patients who had um, severe instability. So in conclusion, lateral ankle sprains are not the benign problem. They've always been promoted to be. Uh, associated injuries are frequent. Uh, the more anatomical the repair, the better the restoration of joint kinematics and contact forces leading to reduced risk of arthritis long-term, at least theoretically, and arthroscopy can be a useful adjunct. Thank you. Dr. Fagan would be proud. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. So any questions? <clears throat> so, Jack. Uh, has there been any work looking at Turn on the lights. Allograft reconstruction versus autograph. Um, no, no, there have have been no studies done on that. It'd be a great study, although I think it would take a lot of numbers to show a difference. Uh, I've been using allograft tendons on the more complicated reconstructions for about. 15 years now. Um, I initially used a lot of allografts like most of us did on ACLs, and so that was what led me to use it on the lateral ankle ligaments, and I really didn't see the problems that we've seen in ACL work with uh, allografts. And I think it's because it's shorter distances, it's extra-articular, and uh, 
and it's not subject to the same forces that the ACL is. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <clears throat>